Okay. If not, then we'll start our lesson this morning called Removing Religious Chains. Speaking of my brother, his daughter, youngest, uh, you saw just carried out a moment ago, is my niece, uh, Lily. Dear little child, my niece, Lily. And uh, we were babysitting her one time at our house, Pam and I, and uh, we thought, well, this is great. We've got the, the nieces and the nephews over. We'll make some, some Chinese food for them. So we got uh, Lily there at the table, and she was just at the age at that time where she was able to sit up and kind of reach out on things, which is great because her hands are moving. And we thought, this is wonderful. We can have a meal with our nieces and nephews. And so what we did, being the great aunts and uncles we were, is took a bowl of rice and a little pork in there and some vegetables and this bowl to set it right in front of this nice little baby. Um, if I knew what was coming, I would not have done that because she just reached out, grabs the bowl, and throws it in the air. You know, and so now we have rice and pork and vegetables just everywhere. And that was my first lesson, not having a child of my own, what not to do with young babies, thinking that, well, they can move around, they're real people now. No, they don't know how to eat yet. So um, anyway, if I knew what was coming, uh, <laughs> Pam and I have uh, come from different cultures, as you know, and um, so I've learned a lot and appreciated her ability to introduce me to a lot of different cuisine. When I was in China, uh, I know that uh, there were things that were foreign to me in, in the food area. And uh, one thing that was not was the giant KFC sign in China, um, which, of course, we all know stands for Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Um, when you're in China and you see KFC, what you will not find in there is Kentucky Fried Chicken. What you will see as I walked in was a picture of an octopus. And I thought, I've never seen that in Kentucky. Um, there, <laughs> some things just don't belong together. Octopi and Kentucky Fried Chicken do not belong together, okay? Uh, babies and a bowl of rice and pork and do not belong together. Um, Romans 11 verse 6 says, grace and works do not belong together, okay? Where there's grace, there's no longer works. Where there's works, there's no longer grace. They do not go together. One reason why we teach the Bible rightly divided here and separate things in the scriptures is because we've read the whole Bible and realized that God has a purpose where he's delivered the teaching of religion and works through Israel. And then there was a time where he dispensed his grace through Paul to the church so that we can have a greater understanding of his, his ultimate purpose for the ages. And when we see that, we recognize, according to Romans 11, 6 and other passages, that grace and religion, grace and works, do not belong together. And so we separate them. When you put them together, there will be spiritual problems. Okay? And we see this all over Christianity, but not only Christianity, but the world. When we see people who are bound by religion, even those, as we discussed earlier, who claim to teach grace, or even half the time or a third of the time will even preach Paul's grace and this sort of thing in the grace gospel. The other half of the time they don't. Or they'll teach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or they'll put you under the law, or they'll teach the Hebrew epistles as being uh, applicable to you, which means you're going to be put under a religious system given to Israel. Okay. This morning I'd like to talk about removing those religious chains, not only in salvation, which is important, but also each day where Paul says to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Apparently it is possible in your spiritual life, not only to, to you can be removed from the, you can have the chains removed, you can be delivered, you can be made free from the bondage of religion, but you can put yourself back under the yoke. You can put yourself. God's not going to do it, but you can put yourself, you see. And this happens quite often when you don't equip yourself with the doctrines of God's grace and that understanding, okay? So when we look at the world around us, and even in yourself, in your own life, we're going to define religion this morning as what you do to earn God's favor or assuage God's wrath. This is the function of religion. Okay, this describes not only the Christian religion, but the Muslim religion, any sort of Eastern religion, in their concept of God. It's how do I earn favor or receive benefits from God, and how do I perform in such a way or live in such a manner that God won't be angry at me, bad things don't happen to me. This is the natural approach to the divine. Okay, and so people are constantly trying to justify themselves. Not only the self-righteous, not only those religious folk who say, well, because of the way I live, God's happy with me, but even those who don't believe God, the secularists, justify themselves. 
They reject the Bible entirely, they reject God, but they're justifying themselves because they will not say there's something wrong with them. They'll say, well, I'm just fine. You say, you know, there's not, I'm just as good as anyone else. There's nothing wrong with me. So they justify themselves. We who know grace doctrine are unique in Christianity from the Bible and articulating to people, you can't justify yourself. And we're looking at both the self-righteous religionist and the worldly who rejects God entirely. They both justify themselves. And we say, you can't. You can't with self-righteous religion, and you can't with your religion of self. <laughs> you see? It's just religion, the same thing. And so people are bound with these chains of religion. And these chains, uh, this binding, is not something necessarily physical. People can feel free. People can think that they're doing it right. But they're spiritual, soul-binding, soul-depressing chains that when you are delivered from them with sound doctrine and truth, maybe many of you have experienced the liberty that you can have in Christ, the joy that comes from being delivered from the chains of sin, works, the flesh, the law, and the world. Okay? And so today we're talking about that. How do we know about these chains? I'm talking about religious chains, and I, I'm, for fear of being overly spiritual, we need to identify what in the world they are. So turn to Romans chapter 3. How do we know we have these chains on us? Because if, unless someone tells us, how do you say? In Romans 3 verse 19. Now we know that the things, so, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. God, in his wisdom, through history and in the Bible, established a religion. He, the only religion God has ever established was with the nation of Israel. And he gave Israel a religion to bring them to knowledge of what was keeping them held back, the religious bondage and the problems that they were under. Okay? And so when we read the Bible, we say we study Paul's epistles alone and we find the doctrine in those epistles uh, as applicable to the church alone. And yet we need all of Scripture to teach us the problem with humanity. Because without the God instructing us in that way, we would think there's nothing wrong with ourselves. We think there's nothing wrong with the world. At the same time, we would complain and, and whine and riot about problems that exist, the hopelessness, the poverty, the despair, right? the, the physical poverty, right? the infirmities, the injustices, the lack of caring and love in the world. All of these things are piled on our, when we observe the world, it's piled on our understanding of things, and we have no answer. Well, God established a religion with Israel, and he taught them, if you do these things, I will bless you. And if you do these things, I'll curse you. He started to instruct Israel in the way of righteousness. Okay? His law. And we learn in Romans 3.19 that the law says to them under law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Apparently, God gave the law, the religion to Israel, so that they would become guilty. Is that what the verse says? It says, he gave the law, those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Why would God do such a thing? Why would God put a religion in the world? Well, it's because man was already under bondage, you understand. They just didn't know it. When Adam sinned and sin entered the world, what happened as a result? Death entered. Corruption entered. A lack of peace entered. Right? Immor uh, mortality entered. You see? And so all these things entered the world, but man didn't know it. He just went about his business. Right? God introduced the religion of the law to Israel so that the world may know that you're all guilty. He can shine the light on the chains that were holding them down by using religion. And by the way, this is the only thing religion can do for you. Show you your bondage. Right? That's what religion does. This is why we need something else. Romans 3 verse 20 says, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we have in these two verses the religious chains we're going to talk about today. Number one, works, when it says that by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Works is something that will drag you down in your spiritual life when you're trusting your own effort. Okay? Religion will constantly tell you to perform and do works to justify yourself. The world will say, we can tell the good people from the bad people because of what they do. Right? 
The world says this, without God's book. So works is a tool, a chain of religion. And when you're trusting your own work, your own effort, your own achievements, you are being held back. God would have you made free, you see. God would elevate you to a heavenly position. God would give you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. God wants you, in him, to receive the riches of his grace. Okay? And when you're trusting your works to get you there, you'll never reach it, you see. You say, well, many people have produced many great things. Many people have achieved many great things. We just saw this last week, this amazing achievement of uh, a businessman becoming the president. And, and the, his competitor was a woman who wanted to be president, being the first woman president in America. And so these great achievements people do. But how many people is that? One out of how many million? Hundreds of million? For every one person who becomes president, we've had 45. How many millions of people didn't? Right? I well, see most of them probably didn't want to be. Fine. You know, you, you, we used to tell little kids in the 90s, you know, be whoever you wanted to be. And maybe, you want to be an astronaut? Do you want to be a doctor? You know, some of them are, yes, because these are the highest things we can think of to achieve, you know. And how many did not become that? And so we have now adults who didn't become what they told they can be become. And they feel that they've been cheated, right? I was told I deserve to, to have my dreams, and I don't have them. And, you know, I, they're not achieved. Okay, a hopelessness, despair, you see. When you're trusting your works, you are bound by something. You're limited by your works. You need to trust God, and specifically his grace. Because if God contributes to what you need, can't there be an unlimited supply of something? Can't there be riches beyond what you can ever attain? Yeah, you see, this is, this is the wisdom of God. Okay, so works is a chain. Your sin is a chain. Okay, Romans 3 verse 20 says, the, By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? So God's only established religion put people under bondage to their own sin. Right? He said, here's 613 points of law, do them. And he knew they couldn't. And so he added the book of Leviticus and says, when you sin, here's animals you can sacrifice so that you can feel better about yourself. Actually, so your sins can be forgiven, is what he says in Leviticus, chapter 4. That you can be made right with God, according to their understanding. But this is the idea of religion, right? When you've done something bad, you have to offer a sacrifice, some atonement, and then, then you're in good standing again. Okay. Not only is your works included, but it's emphasizing your sin. How do you know if you're, go you're in good standing with, under religion? Right? Well, it's based on their laws. It's based on whether you've kept them or not. It's how much sin you have. Right? If you've committed sin, if you have sin, re religion rejects you. You understand that? Okay. So, what religion in the world accepts sinners? The answer is none. No religion in the world accepts sinners. Go about Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. Look at that in a bit. Okay. And so, your sin is a chain, a religious chain. It's, it, and the law, God's law, shines a light on it and keeps you bound to that. This is what the Bible talks about being redeemed or being delivered from these sort of things. The law itself, of course, is a religious chain as uh, there's commandments given from God for Israel to perform. They had to do those. There was no question. They couldn't say, well, I don't feel like doing it today. I'm going to exercise my liberty today or my excuse or my free pass. God said, you, you got to do these. 100%, 24-7, 365 days, you got to do these. Right? So there's a law, requirements, specific requirements. So it's not your prerogative, your preference, what you decide to do. God says, here's the law, you've got to do it. That's a chain. That's an obligation. And so we talk the spiritual application. Is there laws in your life? Are you putting laws on yourself? Is someone else putting laws on you? Are you in a contract with someone in the world? Are you in a working relationship where you're bound to someone? Right? These are all laws, the bondage of the law, where you cannot escape this. And of course, ultimately, spiritually, God gave this law to Israel, and it says that the whole world may become guilty, that every mouth may be stopped. God gave this law, and people try to fight for the Ten Commandments and the law, but the law is a religious chain. Okay? If everyone in America kept the law, they'd all be bound by a religious chain. Why do we want that? Is that our message? You know, love God, love Christ, sign up for the chain, you know. No, that's, that's not our message. The flesh is a chain. You see in Romans 3, verse 20, where it says, By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh 
be justified. Flesh. This kind of relates to your works as well, but anything that has to do with your flesh, your body, your appearance, your person, who you are, where you were born, what status you have, this is all your flesh, right? Your desires, the lust of your flesh, what you want, your dreams, these are all your flesh, okay? Your flesh, apparently, according to Romans 3, 19 and 20, is something that keeps you bound, limits you, holds you back, okay? Your flesh works, your works, your sin, the law you live under, your flesh limits you, okay? You're in bondage to that. When you talk about the world, when it says Romans 3, verse 19, that the whole world may become guilty, the world and the course of that world, is what I talk about specifically, the course of the world, is a chain, Okay? People love to tout the course of the world as if it's deliverance from religious bondage, and it really isn't. Okay, because the world will flee churches and they'll say, well, finally I'm free from all that religious restriction of that church that I grew up in or that religion that I was part of. And they boast in their liberty in the course of the world, which isn't liberty at all, because what's the course of the world? Works of the flesh, sins, selfishness. They've traded the religion of certain clothes and drinking certain things and certain uh, ornamentation and, and rituals in a building for the consequences of sin, right? The, the consequences of pride, the consequences of rejecting God. Hopelessness isn't cured, right? There's still no peace. There's no peace in yourself. There's no peace in the works of the law. There's no peace in the course of the world. There's no peace in the flesh, okay? So all these things limit People. They, they put you under bondage. These spiritual chains can only be broken by a spiritual remedy. And this, of course, is where the gospel comes in. And so we understand the gospel um, of the grace of God is the solution here. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, Romans 6.23, when we talk about how these chains hold us back, the Bible tells us this. And, by the way, only the Bible tells us this. <clears throat> it's interesting to hear the world try to fix its own problems without the Bible because it will do everything it can to imitate what the Bible says without the reality of the Bible. You know, the Bible talks about prayer to God. What's the world say? Well, do some self-meditation, right? Uh, it, 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 the, the instructions it gives to people is to articulate with their words, you know, you know the, the thoughts of their heart. But who are they talking to? a paid counselor or the wall or themselves, you know, just let it out, right? And the Bible says there's a real God, and when you pray, it's a real person that's hearing you. Wait a minute, are, are you saying we should pray? Oh, no, don't pray, that's religious. Just speak words from your heart. To who? Well, you can pay me to listen. <laughs> or you can pray to God. You see, the Bible has the solution to the things, and the world tries to mimic them, but they can't because it's not real what the world provides. It's not eternal what the world provides, right? So the, the world says, just forget it. Put it behind you, right? Move on. And don't you know, if you've ever had an experience where you've been told to move on, that it's not that easy, right? Why? How? How can I move on, right? How can I forget? How can I forgive, right? The Bible provides an actual real solution to this. The Bible doesn't just say forget and forgive. It tells you how you can. And it's spiritual and it's real, you see. When you're under religion, the religion of self-righteousness or the religion of self, you're under chains and you're being held back from understanding the truth, from being able to live. In Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin is death. Sin kills. Okay? That's what Romans 6.23 says. The wages of sin is death. No matter how many people say it doesn't matter if I did this sin or that sin, the consequences of sin is death. Not only ultimately in judgment, but the reason why we all die, of course, is because of sin and death. Death comes from sin. But in your own life, corruption pervades your life because of wrong choices and sins that you commit. Right? Whether you see it or not. A lot of the soft stories and sad stories people give and say, well, my life's been broken and my life hurts here, you can trace it back to wrong choices and sins. But they want to justify themselves and say, it wasn't my sins that caused it, it was bad luck. I'm the victim here. You know, really. Maybe sometimes you are, but most times not. You know, we all sin. That's what the Bible says. The Bible admits it. The Bible tries to show you the truth, that you all sin. That is the problem. Christ is the answer. Right? You need to deal with sins. 
Romans 3.20 talks about the law and the works and fear. It says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is knowledge of sin. Everyone's guilty. The law works fear. I didn't need Romans 3. I needed Romans 4. Romans 4.20. That's still wrong. Romans chapter 4, though, where the law works wrath. Verse 15. Romans 4, verse 15. It says, The law worketh wrath. Where no law is, there is no transgression. You must honor the law. The law breeds wrath. That's what the law does. Okay? Paul says, You're not, You have not been given the spirit of fear. You have not been placed under the bondage of the spirit of fear. You have the spirit of adoption. That's different. Okay? But they, the, the law holds you back because it makes you operate by fear of breaking it. It puts you under the wrath of the lawgiver, which we know ultimately is God, but secondarily, it's the governments of our world. You're under a law. You fear the lawgiver, the enforcer, the avenger. Right? Is that what we're made to do, operate by fear? Does anyone not want to operate by fear? Rather operate in freedom without fear? You see? And so we have whole societies who fight for this. For freedom and you know, for, for not being under the boot of those who would threaten us, right? And the Bible talks about it. It's amazing. Romans 4, verse 15. The law works wrath. And what does Paul say about the law in relationship to you and God? You're not under the law. Right? You're under grace. What is Paul saying when he says that? By implication, he says, God is not operating with you on the basis of fear. You cannot be saved today by fearing God, you see. That's not Christianity. Right. Well, I remember I got saved because, you know, that preacher preached hell to me and I'm just scared to death of God. I'm afraid. I said, I'm, I'm going to do whatever. Whatever you want, God. You want water baptism? Fine. You, you want me to tithe? Fine. You know, just fear principle. That's not salvation. In this dispensation, God says, you know what? It's not going to be of works. It's not going to be of law. It's going to be entirely what I've done to save you by grace. And so I'm not going to count your works, and I'm not going to require works from you. I'm just going to sit here and say, receive me by grace. Trust my grace. Trust what I did. And so there's no fear with God in this dispensation. Now, Christians love to drum up fear. Christian pastors, they love to say, well, God's going to judge you if you don't. You know, in this dispensation, God's not judging anyone, as Aaron pointed out earlier. He's not imputing sins today. There will be a time where judgment comes, right? In this dispensation, our message isn't, if you sin tomorrow, okay, your car is going to break. If our country sins for the next four years, the stock market is going to crash. That's not our message, okay? God's not operating that way in the world, right? But fear and wrath will hold you back. What you should be operating with is peace, right? Instead of wrath, grace. What about the flesh? Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. In Galatians 6, verse 8, the flesh is something that keeps you down, holds you back. This chain of the flesh, which not only do people impose on you externally, labeling you certain things that you may not want to be, but it's something that sticks with you. I mean, you're born with it, right? It really, it's hard to separate yourself from your flesh. So people who get stuck in saying, well, I've been born in such a condition. There's really nothing they can do about that. And so people, hello. <laughs> so people talk about the uh, flesh, uh, uh, or, or talk about their condition that they're born into and how they want to have equal uh, position this way. So it's not fair that people are born into different, different opportunities, you know, different uh, circumstances. All right. Well, there's no way in the world that any country, any government can fix this. We're born in different circumstances. And that has a major effect on our life, right? Okay, your flesh, who you are, your personality, your, your wealth, right? Some societies, no longer in our country, well, may, some argue, your class, what class are you in? Middle class, low class, you know. This affects how people see you. And some people think how, they, uh, how it affects the relationship with God. Galatians 6, verse 8 says, he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you're operating according to your flesh, living after your flesh, then you're reaping corruption. Okay, Corruption. This has to do with uh, the degradation of something. Something's going to wind down. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be um, corrupted. You put food on the counter, it's going to rot. Corruption. 
right? And so you are rotting when you operate according to your flesh. It's only when you operate and live and walk according to the spirit that you can say, I have life everlasting. Because every testimony of your flesh is that you're, you're going down. You're rotting, you see. So who's a Christian to say, no, I'm not living forever. Looks like you're getting kind of wrinkly, you know. But when Christians are on their deathbed and they're looking pretty bad and they say, I've got eternal life, that's because they're operating by faith in what God told them, that they have resurrection by faith in what Christ did on the cross. Living in the Spirit, with the understanding of the Spirit. So the flesh is a chain. People get to their deathbed without understanding the gospel, and they're still trying to earn their way to heaven. Why do they deserve that? How many times do I go to church? Did I do enough? Am I there? Did I hope I did enough? They're asking for forgiveness on their deathbed like Constantine did, you know. Be delivered from that. Be saved from that. Right? We need God's grace. And finally, the world. And I quoted 1 John 2.15, because the problem with the world isn't all the fun things. The problem with the world isn't all the pleasurable things. The problem with the world is that it's always, always, always temporal. Temporary. Never lasts. Even the good movies have credits. <laughs> You're going, why? What? what about another couple hours? You know, it's great. Oh, now they're done. Sorry. Didn't last. Right? The world passes away is what the Bible says. The world passes away. So not only do we degrade and we rot, we cor we're corrupted, not only does sin that we do by the flesh kill us, right? Not only do we operate by fear, fear of death, fear of God, under wrath, under a religious system, but the world, those whole system passes away. We're just whispers, you know? We're blowing in the wind, as they say. This is the condition of, of, of life, of humanity. And it is hopeless, folks. These are religious chains, the self-righteous religious chains and the re religion of self. Without God, you have religion. Okay? We need a solution to this. God instituted a religion with Israel so that he could show them these problems clearly. When you break my law, I will show you wrath. The reason, and he talked about flesh under the law, right? And the works under the law to show them they could not do enough. There was continual requirement from the law, right? So all of this was there to show that they can't do it by themselves. Because God from the beginning, and, and yea, before the beginning, had in his mind a purpose of giving grace to the world. That's always been God's purpose. Okay? But it was secret. So we've drawn charts before where just by reference we have the beginning and the end, and we've got the beginning of the earth here, and we've got God giving his only religion to Israel. Galatians 4 says Jesus Christ was born in Jerusalem under the law, or in, in Israel rather, in Bethlehem, under the law, in Galatians chapter 4. So was Jesus operating at a time under the religion of God? He was. Jesus was not born a Gentile. He was born a Jew, right? And that mattered, because the Messiah had to be a Jew. John 4 says salvation was of the Jews. So, flesh mattered. Did Jesus come down and say, all right, guys, we're done with this law thing. I'm going to do whatever I want. Or did he do good works? Did he do miraculous works? His works mattered. right? His flesh mattered. He was born of the law and he kept the law. Did Jesus have sin? No. But that all mattered because he, was, he came under religion. He came under religion to deliver the world from religion. You understand? That's what he came to do. And so, you know, Chris Tomlin sings the song Amazing Grace, and he says, my chains are gone. Because of Christ, your chains are gone. Because of Amazing Grace, your chains are gone. Right? But grace wasn't given here under the Old Testament. Grace wasn't given here when Jesus was still operating with Israel in the flesh. Grace wasn't even given here when Jesus died, and here's his mother weeping at the death of Jesus. Did she understand God's grace? Not yet, you see. God kept his grace a secret until he revealed it to his chief persecutor, the guy who was killing the people, preaching Jesus was the, a, a good Jew and a Messiah and the King and the Christ. And Saul was persecuting those people. And God says, this is a pretty good time right here to show my grace. And with that man who was Saul, who didn't deserve anything, okay, because he was anti-Christ, he was anti 
the God of Jesus Christ, right? And he dispensed grace, and Paul calls it in Ephesians chapter 3, the dispensation of God's grace. And he adds Gentiles sometimes, just to point out, it has nothing to do with Jews, you know. It's to everyone. Dispensation of God's grace. And so we have religion. 90% of your Bible talks about God's purpose through his people of the flesh for the earth to operate according to their works to deal with sin through their covenant, right? This is a religion, and it's God's religion that he gave to Israel. 90% of the Bible talks about that. And in just some 13 small books, you have this revelation, this dispensation of God's grace. Where now, when we read the scripture in its entirety, we read what Christ revealed to Paul in his writings. We can read about God's grace and how much it differs from, it's separate from, and even what Paul says. He doesn't say things that differ in Philippians 1. He says things that are more excellent than Grace excels, exceeds religion. Okay? And so, in the back of, on the back of your outline, I've got some 33 different comparisons. And I even spent the minute to organize them by length. You see that? Nice and pretty list there. Amazing. Just for fun. <clears throat> we can read through these. Each one of these is a lesson. In fact, these might be pretty good for the next Faithful Men Project, if we want to get around to it, to preach one of these each week. There's, they're opposites. Grace and religion do not mix. Grace and works do not mix. Grace and your flesh do not mix. Grace and sin do not mix. Grace and the law do not mix. You see? They don't belong together. Grace gives, for one. Grace, we talked earlier about how people really distort and hide what grace really means. The Bible talks about grace as being what someone provides for you when you don't deserve it. That's what grace is. Grace is what God did through Jesus Christ on the cross for you when you didn't deserve a thing. You see, it's not just that he did something nice for you, like you do something nice for your neighbor. I mean, you have a perfectly fine neighbor, you like them, they like you, and you bake them a cake. You know, this is fine, this is kind, but, you know, it doesn't give them something they don't deserve, right? What if that neighbor was the worst neighbor in town? Constantly mowing on your side of the property line, you know, whatever they do it, and... And instead, you still make them a cake. <laughs> That's something they just simply do not deserve. You know, grace gives, religion takes. Right? Grace gives to people who don't deserve it. Religion takes from people to try to see what they can give. Okay? You know you're under a religion when the, the system, the group, the denomination, the church, the organization you're operating in is constantly taking from you. Take, take, take. Right? In yourself, when you think that someone else is taking, taking, taking from you. Right? This is religious thinking. Grace rests, religion works. You know, if Christ did everything to pay for your sins by his grace, what's that mean for you and the work you've got to contribute? Nothing. Is Christ doing any more work to save anybody? No. He did it all. You say, grace rests. Religion never rests, folks. Religion constantly works. Religion requires works. Grace delivers you from sin. Religion binds you. Talking about religious chains this morning. Grace justifies you. Religion makes you guilty. You see, because religion looks at you. Grace looks at some other person who did it for you. So You can only be justified by grace. You can only be justified in your sinful, fleshly, worldly, law-keeping self if someone else does it for you. Someone else who is perfect. Someone else who can make an eternal payment. Someone else who has a mediation and a contact communication with God and who's a human. Oh, who in history lived a perfect life, who was God manifest in the flesh, who offered an eternal payment for sins? It's only Jesus Christ. He's the only one that fits the bill. You see, you can only be justified by Christ. Grace lifts up, religion anchors you down. Grace reflects, religion expects. I'm telling you, there's sermons in here somewhere, you guys. You just pick one. We'll, we'll have you teach on 10 a.m. Grace forgets, religion reminds. You know, Paul says, forget those things that are behind. And this is heresy in a religious system. Because what's religion do? Come into this box and confess your sins. Think about what you've done bad last week and tell me what you did wrong. You know, you'll stand before the pearly gates and what will happen? What did Jack Chick, who died this last week, what did he write his most famous tract? Everybody know Jack Chick? A little cartoon tracks. He died this last week. And his most famous one 
was It's a Wonderful Life, where the guy dies and he stands in outer space or heaven or wherever, and God shows a movie of his life, you know. You're sitting there watching it. But what's that do, that concept that you're going to look back now at your past to see whether or not you made it, you worthy, you were worthy. You see, grace forgets, because grace pays for your sins. Grace performs, and Paul says, forget those things that are behind. Press on to those things that are before. Religion says, what would you do last week? You see, let's check that out. Let's evaluate. That's a problem. Religion expects. Okay. Religion reminds. Grace forgets. Grace saves. Religion condemns. Grace relieves you from burdens. Religion burdens you with burdens. Okay. You can read all these yourself. There's plenty in there that, that uh, are found in Paul's epistles. Grace liberates you. He gives you liberty. Religion dominates you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 that he would not have a dominion over your faith. That's because he can't. If he's teaching grace, he can't have dominion. So any person who says, I'm, I'm trying to put you under dominion of myself, is just teaching religion. Okay? You understand the... The liberty, not only the liberty, but the power and the riches you have by God's grace. If you're not under the dominion of anyone, what does that mean? Huh? You're in the one who is the head of all principality and power over all things. There is no one that has dominion over you. Neither life, nor death, nor sin, nor hell, nor any nation, or any country, or religion, or denomination. This is empowering, you see. Well, Paul was misogynist. He hated women. Really? Do you know grace at all? Because according to grace, no one has dominion over you. You see? If you know that doctrine. It's amazing. Grace shows love. Religion shows, shows sin. There's no way religion shows love. It can't. People say, well, acts of kindness. That does it. That's not true love. That's people meeting obligations. Okay? What do I do to be a good Christian or be a good person? Well, you do good works. How do you know that person actually wants to do them? Because a religion requires them, you see. Grace says it's not required. It's not a necessity. Grace says there's no requirement of you because grace says the work's been done for you by Christ. right? So the work's been done, and so you can't do anything for your salvation. And so the self-righteous religious person says, and the self-righteous, or the self-religion person says, the unbeliever, Says, no, that's not right at all. We've got to do things for ourselves. We've got to prove ourselves. There are some people that are bad, some people are good. The Bible says all are bad. It's not your works. Okay? And you've got to trust what Christ did. And when you do that, then it allows you, it in a way motivates you to do things. Not because you have to, not because of necessity, but because you want to. Right? An amazing transformation happens. No longer is it you trying to perform. Now it's you're doing it because I purpose in my heart, which is grace. Grace purposes in your heart. Religion performs in your flesh. The thing about grace, if someone else does it for you, if Christ does it for you, the thing about grace is you can only receive that by faith. You cannot receive grace by you doing anything. Okay? So grace is received by faith. And religion receives by works. If you don't perform, you're out. Okay? So you can go and study about all those on the back of your outline there, the difference between grace and religion. It's amazing the riches of God's grace that you have. As we talk about the chains this morning that steal hope and peace and life and joy and make, and make everything about your life that you think is meaningful temporary, in Christ you redeem, you get back things that you know are good, like life, peace, joy, hope. You get these things back, because not only is it temporary, it's eternal in Christ. Not only that, you're not limited by the chains of your own self, of your own flesh, of works, of any law. Now you are empowered and positioned in Christ to be above all things. You see how, how wonderful and amazing God's grace is. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, We've been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? All spiritual blessings? Can you even name all spiritual blessings? See, this is something we need to figure out. What in the world does that mean? We've done a lesson on that here where Jeremy listed a bunch of spiritual blessings and it's a good study so that you can appreciate what God has done because this whole thing of removing religious chains, we'll talk about here in a moment, 
It's something that you've got to understand. It's not where I take a clipper and, you know, I can't do it for you, you say. I can't do it. You've got to hear the word of truth, to hear God's grace. When you hear the gospel and believe it, the chains start to fall off. When you hear the doctrine of God's grace, you understand it. You know the riches that you've been given by God's grace. You know your position in God's grace. Then the chains fall off, you see. That's how it works. Christ is giving you the victory through his grace. So Ephesians 1 verse, or 2 verse 7 rather, says that he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The exceeding riches of his grace. That's what you have. While religion seeks to earn riches, you have them freely. Okay? It's for you to understand them, to grow in them. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. You see how grace is given to him? He doesn't earn it, he doesn't work for it, he doesn't deserve it. Grace is given to him. And he's the least of all saints. So that leaves room for you. <laughs> right? That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's offering free riches to Gentiles who don't deserve it. Who in the flesh never had a covenant about it. Never pro was promised it. Who are filled with sin. You see, this is what grace does. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Religion and religious chains keeps you from enjoying salvation, the riches of glory, life, and peace. Perhaps you understand, I know Christ died for my sins. I know the gospel of the grace of God. But perhaps you're living your Christian life according to the same chains you were delivered from. Because you don't yet understand what grace has done for you. You know, it's like you, you, you tell someone they can get out of jail. You open the door, you, you clip the chains, and they just sit there. I'm stuck here. This is how sometimes you operate. I operate. We operate. Okay. We need to be reminded of what Christ has done to deliver us, to free us from these chains, and exercise our liberty, stand fast rather than liberty, for Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the open bondage. Don't let them limit us. Don't let the chains, don't let the sin, the works, the flesh, law, the world, restrain or restrict us from what we have access in Christ. How do you remove the chains? Well, first you have to know the gospel. Romans 10, 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So you have to know the gospel of God's grace. Christ is the Savior, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Justifier. You have to also understand that Christ dispensed the gospel of grace to save. In Titus 2, verse 11, uh, Paul says grace was given for salvation. 2 Timothy 1, 10, it says by the gospel, immortality has come to life. And so we understand that through the gospel of grace, through Jesus Christ, these chains of sin and our works and the law and the flesh and the world are taken away. Okay? Grace breaks the chain through faith in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because you can't boast, you can't work. It's what Christ did. By grace, through faith, you are saved. Not by works you have done, lest any man should boast. Right? We understand this gospel. So faith requires you understanding that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Faith requires, or grace requires you uh, trust that. And this is why we preach. This is why we teach. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, uh, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. That's the Bible. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, that we have the Spirit, that we may know the things that are freely given of God. We're saved so that we can actually know that they're true about us, because we believe the gospel. And then we compare, we study, we teach, we speak the things the Holy Ghost taught from the Bible so that we can understand and compare spiritual things to spiritual. Okay? We don't apply religion to our Christian life. We don't apply our flesh to our Christian life. We don't apply we don't say sin will help us or is okay to our Christian life. It's not our works in our Christian life. It's grace that's applied to our Christian life. And yet, I fear because so often, and it's so common because it was a common in Paul's day as well, that Christians put themselves back in these chains. They're entangled again with the yoke of bondage, even though Christ has made them free. 
Galatians 1, 6 says so much when Paul says, I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he that called you into the grace of Christ, you were removed from that. You should not be removed from the grace of Christ. It's by God's grace that you are who you are. It's by God's grace you have riches. It's by God's grace you have a heavenly position. By, you owe everything you are to God's grace in Christ. Why would you remove yourself from that? Okay. How do you remove yourself from that? <laughs> and you say, well, I don't want to, you know. I don't want to be removed from that. Sounds good. But you can inadvertently, okay? Because simple, brief, a lot more things happen in the Bible. But where do you find grace in the scripture? Here, right? Here. What happens if we want to teach from here? Huh? You can inadvertently put people back under religion. Okay. You can put people back under law. You can rob them of their riches. And this happens all the time. This is why we emphasize it so much. You say, why do you emphasize this so much? I mean, what's the point? The point is because grace is what saves, grace is what delivers, grace is what justifies. Read the back. Grace, this is what grace does for you. And if you mix grace with law, mix grace with flesh, if you mix them, if you don't rightly divide them, it will limit, it will put you back under the change of bondage. You'll be entangled again. And Paul says, whatever, Galatians, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What's Paul saying? In another application, he's saying, rightly divide the word of truth. Right? Because if you don't, those, what, what were the Galatians doing? Did they not believe Jesus anymore? Did they say, that's it, I'm done with Christianity, I'm going back to Judaism? No, they didn't, right? They still believed Jesus. What did they do? They believed Jesus under the law. Where do we find Jesus under the law? In the Bible. Right here. Right? Someone who believed in Jesus was teaching them under the law. And Paul says, that's not the gospel I taught to you. you. See, Don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul's not against Christ. He speaks about Christ more often than anyone else because it, he has to, because it's all of grace. <laughs> and Christ provided the grace. You see. Galatians 5.25 It's in this context of these Galatians who were believing Jesus but trying to operate under the law program it says Jesus was born, made of a woman, under the law. Matthew 23, Jesus taught the law. Have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? And the one they paint all the pictures about? The ones that, it's all red letters, those pages. So this is a safe place, right? Red letters. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, what do you say? I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And if any one of you teach against the law, you'll be the least in the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. Red letters. Why did he say that? I thought grace, the grace of Christ, Jesus came to deliver us from the law. It's because when he said it, it was to Israel in the religious system. Okay. This had not yet been revealed. By the way, can we step back from that for a moment? You say, well, why did God do that? I mean, why did he, why did he dispense grace then? Why does it, does it matter to God that we separate these things historically? Because the lessons had to be learned, you see. We need to separate religion and grace in the Bible because both of them have their place. Religion in the Bible teaches us that it can't be the flesh. It can't be our own works. It can't be the law that saves us. And it had, the lesson hadn't yet been fulfilled. The lesson had to continue. They had to crucify him on the cross. The spirit had to come. They had to reject the spirit before God says, you know what? That's it. You got if you can't, there's no more proof I can provide. You guys are worthless, all of you. And then he dispenses grace. The lesson had to be learned. What if he dispensed grace back here under, under Israel's law? What if he did it back here, prematurely? Right? Here's the law, guys, but you know, it's really grace. Wouldn't they have been tempted not really to understand and appreciate what this is? And they'd be like, oh, so I've got to do that work, but you're giving it for, for free anyway? Whatever. Doesn't matter. Right? This is what happens with your kids, too, by the way. Give your kids grace prematurely, they won't appreciate it. All right? This should provide a motivation for children to grow up out of the state of the law, but also a motivation for parents to teach them the principle here. They need to understand this before they can understand this. All right? You see? 
And that, that's why, you know, when you're young, you should. If you understand this, when you're young, you should understand, I want out of this. I want this. Well, all right. Take responsibility. You know? Grace takes responsibility. It's on the back of the outline here. Religion acts of necessity. Right. You have to clean your room at home. It's a religion. <laughs> and I'm your God. You know? That's what that is. Grace is, you have your own house. You do what you want. You're at liberty. You know, that's what that is. Galatians 5.25 says, in the context of the Galatians, um, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we're living according to God's grace in the Spirit, we have to walk that way as well. And in Galatians chapter uh, 6, it says in verse 8, He that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. How do you walk in the Spirit? Before the Spirit's given? Hmm? The thought. Right? People go back to Matthew, Luke, and John. They go back to Psalms and Isaiah and Jeremiah. How do you walk in the Spirit when most of the Spirit's been given? Well, the Spirit was given at Pentecost, right? So it's got to be at least there. So there are many dispensationalists who start the church here and they say, well, that's where it began. Well, they're wrong because the lesson hadn't been learned yet. But that's the earliest it can be because the Spirit was given then. This grace hadn't been revealed. You can't walk in the Spirit unless you have the Spirit. And you can't walk according to the dispensation of grace until the dispensation of grace has been revealed. Right? So how could they be delivered from God's grace before God revealed His grace that delivers them? See, this, this is why we need to rightly divide. So we can understand the differences here. Okay? Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Maybe this will blow your mind. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. That's one of the problems, the religious chains, right? It feeds your flesh. One of the problems with creating rules and standards um, and requirements is that it feeds the flesh. Okay? And this is a problem. We want people who are motivated by God's grace, performing according to God's grace, and that's a lot harder to do. It's a lot harder to teach that, because you have to get the doctrine inside people, and the doctrine has to work, and then it has to work out of them. Right? If I just obligated you, I can make you do it. I can make you afraid, you know, make you do it. All right? I can just tell you it's a requirement, and I have dominion over you, and you've got to do it. This is easy. But grace, I have to tell you there's no one who has dominion over you, no one can force you to do it, but please understand this principle, and when you understand it, it works in you, and it works out. It takes a little more time for that. I wish it wouldn't. But 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, Paul says, um, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, Amen, praise God. Grace doesn't know men after the flesh, but after the Spirit, right? Look what it says next. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. Where in the Bible do you find Christ in the flesh? Here. What's Paul saying there? He's saying grace has been given, and according to grace, we know no man. I don't know you after the flesh or me after the flesh. You should know me as a member of the body of Christ. Right? Which is hard sometimes because you're looking right at my flesh. <laughs> and if you know me more personally, you see my flesh all the time. So it takes some effort to say, you know what I know is I know you after the Spirit. And I know Christ made you a new creature. And so what this is that I'm seeing right here is just your old man, right? That's your old man? And I know the Bible tells us to reckon our old man dead. You know, That's how you put a, a grace guilt trip on people, right? <laughs> you encourage them. <laughs> it's exhortation. You've been delivered from all this. Isn't that great? <laughs> I choose to walk in sin. This is a problem. But 2 Corinthians 5.16, Christ after the flesh is right here. At Pentecost, what did they preach in Acts 2 and 3? They preached Christ as they knew him in the flesh. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. Amen, praise God, but it was not God's grace. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Someone asked a great question the other day on the internets, and they said, how do I know 1 John is written to Israel and not to us? <clears throat> okay. One way you know is that uh, in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul goes to Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John say to Paul, you go to the heathen, we'll go to the circumcision. Who's that? Israel. And so when you find books in your Bible written by Peter, James, and John, who do you think they're writing to? Circumcision. Because they said so in Galatians 2. Right? 
Not only that, but you read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, it, normally at the beginning of the, these epistles, you find little details about why they were writing. And it says, That which was from the beginning, which sounds like John, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Yes, thank you, John. He always sounds like that. But what's he saying? He says, we saw him, we handled him, we touched him, right? John, when did you do that? Oh, here, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before he died and rose, rose again. And Thomas could say, even after he resurrected, we touched him. <laughs> but it had to do with Christ and his flesh, right? That's what 1 John's writing about. That which from the beginning, and his beginning is this right here, right? He says, and we handled him, we touched him, we saw him with our eyes. Do you need to see Jesus to walk according to the Spirit today? No, in fact, the opposite instruction is given, walk by faith, not by sight. You need to know Jesus in the flesh in order to walk by Christ according to his grace today. No. You see? Do you, do you need to understand every sin you commit to understand God's grace today? No. Do you need to create a sacrifice for every sin you commit in order to walk by God's grace today? No. That's your works, right? Grace delivers from these things, folks. When you mix grace and law, you mix Christ in the flesh versus Christ according to mystery, Christ of prophecy according to Christ of mystery, then you're mixing law and grace, and you're putting people back under spiritual bondage, and you're entangling them with a yoke they don't need to be entangled with. It's confusing, and it's debilitating, and it hinders spiritual growth. When works are added to Christ's work, in James 2.24, Christians constantly add works to the faith of Jesus Christ, right? This is a problem. You should, every time someone quotes James 2.24, faith without works is dead, you should think chains and bondage. That's what it is. My faith without works is not dead because Christ is the one who did the work. My faith's in him. That's grace. See, that's not James 2.24. Who the only time mentions the word grace, he says it's only a given to those who humble themselves. So I've got a, that's not right. Grace is given through faith in what Christ accomplished. You can be entangled by the yoke and bondage. We're in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We were talking about this earlier. When you tell people that they still have to confess their sins, you still need to ask for forgiveness. This is you being entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Because why do you feel a need to confess your sin? Hmm? Because you've wronged God. I mean, this is sin, right? And you've got a conscience, and you know what's right and wrong. And I've wronged God, and I love God, and I don't want to wrong Him. And so you feel this guilt. You feel... And that's a proper response to sin, to hate it. And you say, you know what? I need to ask God for forgiveness. And you teach your children this, right? But do you know God's grace? Where he died for all of your sins, he paid it all, as we sing in the song, in Colossians 2.13, it was for all trespasses. And every one of the trespasses in that word all occurred before you were even born. So you say, well, that's the moment of salvation. You weren't even born when Paul wrote that. Every sin of yours in Colossians 2.13 is future. You're saved when you trusted what Christ did in the past. You trusted what he did. And you are changed. Your sins are dealt with by Christ, not by you praying for forgiveness. Right? So when you tell saints that you still need to ask for forgiveness, even though you're saved, what does salvation mean? And what are you why are you confessing? God knows them all anyway, and he paid for them all. And yeah, you should hate sin. You should not sin. And when you sin, as the suggestion was this morning, a great suggestion, say, thank you, God, for paying for my sins, because it really hurts me that I do that, because I love you so much. And I thank you for dying for my sins. I thank you for the grace you've given me, because that grace means I don't have to be burdened by the guilt of sin, because you took my sin for me. Right? If that's true, why are you burdening yourself, limiting yourself? I mean, how long do you go before you pray for forgiveness? So all day you're feeling guilty. All day you're feeling like you're out of touch with God. I mean, you're out of fellowship with him, right? Because, you know, we were in good standing this morning, but then I sinned, and so we're kind of out of fellowship. And You could have been walking in fellowship all day with him if you understood the fellowship of the mystery. God's grace, right? But you, you decided to reject that and be entangled again with what the pastor said when he said, when you sin, you need to confess it. That's law teaching, right? 
Romans 4, 5 says, To him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. God justified you, not because you confessed your sins, but because he died on the cross for you. You were ungodly. The only people that can be saved are ungodly people. That should make you feel better, because you're good at that. <laughs> right? You don't boast in your sins. But you are the ungodly. And he dies for the ungodly. Only ungodly can be justified by faith. Not by confession. By teaching people their hope and peace is found in the world, not in Christ. When you, look, you teach people that you can look around you and your circumstances, if they give you hope and peace, and that's where you find it. Paul says in this life, if we only have hope in this life, we're of all men most miserable. Right? That's a good, good analysis of political elections. <laughs> if the, people count on this guy or that, this woman or that person to, to save our country, and you know, we have a savior already. The king of kings already came. The Lord has come, and he's not elected as your head. He is the head, and we have a message that he, God knows the end from the beginning. He's seen 2017. He knows what's coming. He's told you to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think he knows best, or do you think you know best? God, what we really need is lower taxes. You know? No, he said preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 6, 8, and 9, 7 and 8 then says, As you received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Right? Colossians 2, verse 8 says, Don't follow the vain philosophy of the world, the rudiments of the world, the things that are not after Christ. Christ is all that matters. Grace is how you live. Christ is how you think. Christ is your mind. Grace is how you enjoy the free things he's purchased for you. And right division protects us, guides us, shows us where to find the understanding. If we mix grace with the rest of the Bible, we're going to put yourself back under the yoke of bondage. This is a problem for our thinking. We should understand all scripture. We should know what God is doing in the future and in the past. But our operation, our ministry, is what God is doing today, which is his grace dispensed to the world. And operating in you. Okay? God's law was holy and just and good. God's purpose for Israel will be fulfilled in the future. God has a place for that Sermon on the Mount, which talked about the kingdom. But it's not now, you see. And we need to know that. That but now, God is preaching his grace. And so when the Bible says stand fast in liberty, that means to stand fast in God's grace, is what that means. And that word fast, by the way, unless you, you're not aware of what that means. You ever heard someone say, play fast and loose? You ever heard that? Play fast and loose? You know what that means? Nobody knows this either. <laughs> it means be careless, right? Fast and loose. The idea is fast was something that was firm. Loose was something that was all around like this. And so you didn't know what it was. Was it stable or unstable? You just don't know. Don't play fast and loose with it. He says, be fast. Don't be loose. Be fast. Firm. Established. Grounded. Don't say, grace and works. Right? All the Bible. No, don't be that. Stand fast in the liberty. Stand fast in God's grace. For with Christ has made you free. And be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Paul's telling Galatians, don't go back. Right? There's no turning back once you receive God's grace. We ought to rejoice in it. We ought to love it so much that when people infringe on it, we say, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you're... you're you're breaking into my bank account where I have the riches of God's grace and you're stealing my money. That, that's how sensitive we should be to an infringement on God's grace. Okay. On the back of your outline at the bottom of that list there, I said we are Christians because Christ gave us grace, not because we follow Christ's religion. You've got to consider that. We are not Christians because we follow Christ's commandments, folks. We are Christians because Christ gave us grace. That's why you're a Christian. And hopefully you'll realize once you appreciate his grace that receiving grace is not the greatest blessing you'll ever get. The greatest blessing you'll ever receive is when, when you receive grace, let it work in you, and then you start to give it to other people. You see it operating in you. Suddenly that's the greater blessing. Giving grace, not just receiving it. But that's another lesson for another day. Any comments, any questions about standing fast? All right. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the liberty that you've given us freely. We thank you for the message that we have to preach, the books we have to preach them from. I pray that we would understand what the riches of your grace mean. Help us to live by them. Help us to honor you by proclaiming them, not diminishing them, not hiding them, not mixing them with law, rather presenting them purely to people so that they understand the freeness of what you've given them. Hopefully we can see by then souls saved as your will is and that saints could be edified, being strengthened and equipped by the power that you provided in your grace. 
Amen.